Divinity Original Sin 2, developed and published by Larian Studios, is one of the longest and most challenging games I've played in recent memory. Based on the PSN achievements, only about 7% of the people who started the game have completed it, and there were a handful of times that I was ready to throw in the towel myself. In this review, I'll highlight its strengths and some hurdles you'll have to persevere through to help give you a better feeling if you should check out this game now, especially for those waiting for the retail launch of Boulder's Gate 3. Divinity Original Sin 2, or DOS 2 for short, released in September of 2017, has great reviews and one of the highest rated RPGs of this decade. It has a deep, immersive story revolving around elements of high fantasy in the world of Rivalon, where elves, humans, dwarves, lizards, undead, and dragons are always in conflict with each other and among themselves. While elements such as an oppressive religious order, magic leading to corruption, and the otherworldly void that demons inhabit may not seem new, Larian Studios plays to its strengths by putting player choice at the center of this game. The D&D vibe is brought to the forefront with the inclusion of the narrator that acts as a dungeon master of sorts, which you'd think may make it feel less immersive, but it's one of my favorite aspects of the game. Having the narrator describe the romance scene in explicit detail as your two characters just stand there adds to the game's charm and hilarious moments. She nips and kisses newly exposed flesh all over your body, running her mouth from your neck to your belly button, down to your shins, up to your thighs. Ugh, that is one beautiful man. DOS 2 is a more traditional RPG similar to Baldur's Gate or Dragon Age Origins. You pick your starting race and class and put together a team to help you along the way, or go it alone if you prefer. The story follows you and your party who are godwoken those who are sorcerers with the potential of becoming the next divine, basically the strongest person in the realm utilizing the mysterious power of source. But the catch is that there could only be one who ascends to the status of divine, and each of your party members are also on the same path with their own motivations. The characters in the game are definitely my favorite part, more so than the main story. They each have their own struggles that unfold slowly over the game's four acts. In conjunction with the entertaining dialogue options, their unique personal stories, and optional romancing choices, by the conclusion of the game, talking to each character before the end credits were bittersweet. You have Ifan Ben Mezd, who was a loyal soldier of the previous divine who is seeking answers. The Red Prince, a royal in his own kingdom, who has to uncover the plot that took him out of power. Sybil, an elf who was made captive by the master who she is seeking to kill. Losa, the bard who has a powerful demon possessing her. Fane, an undead searching for the clues of his past. And Beast, a dwarf whose queen has become more power hungry. Choose your party wisely, as anyone not in your immediate party will be inaccessible after the first act. Many choices like this make your actions more impactful. The combat is solid and what you'd expect from a turn-based tactical RPG. The order you attack is based on your initiative stat and you start each turn with 4 AP that is used when you move, perform spells, or use items. The innovated system here is the pools of vitality, physical armor, and magic armor. Each spell has different effects, such as ice freezing, fire burning, or effects that can change the course of battle, such as knockdown effects or mind control. Seriously, there are so many types of status effects, and here is just a short list. but these effects are resisted if you have sufficient physical or magic armor. So while you have a lot of spells to replenish vitality, your standard health, it's more important to keep your physical and magic armor topped off defensively, but at the same time trying to deplete your enemy's armor while on the offensive. That, my friends, is much easier said than done. Unless you make it a priority to get high initiative when leveling up your characters, you often find yourself ambushed, and find yourself stunned or crowd controlled during battle. Each fight is a challenge and the small upgrades in the loot you get for defeating enemies, completing quest chains, and selling items to purchase new loot is made all that much more impactful. You will go up against enemies that have a different amount of physical versus magic armor, so the first decision when jumping into the game is your party's composition to favor physical or magic attacks, or a balance of the two. Some battles can be skewed in one direction, 
like fighting a group of mages with high magic armor and low to no physical armor. But other times you run into the opposite, and I often found myself wishing I had a different type of attack or needing to rely on items. Items such as scrolls and potions can prove extremely helpful as it allows other classes to use spells that they haven't learned from tomes, such as healing or elemental damage. Other than AP, there are also source points that unlock as you progress through the story that are used in the most powerful spells, either offense or defensively. These source points don't regenerate after each turn like AP does, and you'll want to save them for the more difficult fights. Source points can also be stolen from other enemies, but also be stolen from you as well. There is just so much depth to the game, from stat allocation and different abilities that most modern games have removed for simplicity or adapted for a larger audience. While you can reallocate your stat and skill points after the first act, there is a learning curve or time needed to watch videos to truly understand how to get the most out of your levels, as you can easily feel underpowered if you don't know what you're doing. So with that complexity comes with it a lot of trial and error, or looking up information on the best builds. The game is always challenging, and not using your points effectively when leveling definitely feel like you're being put at a disadvantage that becomes more apparent as the game progresses. Since I mentioned the challenge, let's jump into why most people won't complete this game and why I can't recommend it for everyone. Even on the normal difficulty, the game is brutally difficult. The beginning of each act can get really frustrating as you encounter enemies that are higher level than you that you have no chance against. Often you are ambushed when exploring, and fleeing from battle requires you to get far away from the enemy, which is difficult to do when you are slowed or surrounded. You will learn early on that enemies more than one level higher than you are going to face roll you. So while starting a new act and exploring is what I enjoy in most games, you always need to be mindful of your level and complete quests in a specific order. Hardware-wise, on the PS4, the load times to return to a previous save feel way too long. The PS4 version also have many minor inconveniences that I just suggest playing the game on the PC if possible. Oftentimes, I would misclick by attacking the ground instead of moving to that location, selecting the wrong unit, or doing something that wastes a turn that could mean the difference between life and death. Inventory management feels more tedious, the graphics quality is significantly lower, and while the UI is fine, there are a lot of functions I forget are mapped to which buttons. The game also throws in a variety of puzzles and mechanics that can feel downright unfair, such as enemies exploding barrels of death fog that can instantly kill you, enemies that respawn or continue to come in waves, battles between two sets of enemies, and my least favorite near the end where you have to pull levers in a specific order while the enemy attacks you. If you're not the type of player who looks up solutions online or reads every single detail in the game, there are quite a few points where you may just quit out of frustration. The game is also extremely long, taking me over 100 hours to beat, which I felt was necessary because in order to succeed by the last act, you need enough experience from completing all the side missions and money from finding and selling items in order to be strong enough to get through the story missions. After the first act and always feeling underleveled going into the next act, I felt required to complete all the side missions by looking at online guides to make sure I got all the experience and items available to even stand a chance. Honestly, the last 30 hours felt more like a drag, and my motivation was more about not wasting the time I've already invested versus really enjoying the experience. But for those knowing that you can easily spend 200 plus hours on a second playthrough with different builds, characters, and experimenting with systems like crafting which I completely ignored, will find a lot of value here. While Divinity Original Sin 2 deserves all the praise it has received, it's definitely not for everyone. While providing a lot of choices, deep mechanics, interesting characters and quests, it's not as user friendly and expects players to learn things on their own through experimentation, or relying on online communities. I often feel that most games are too easy, so it's rare to see a game like this that doesn't hold your hand, making getting to the end all that more significant. If you've made it this far, thanks for sticking with me. I hope this review was helpful, or you found it interesting. Let me know by leaving a comment, like, or sub if you'd like to see more content from this channel in the future. And until next time.